always, for years, I start the new year with uh, a series that gives us an opportunity to like stop and think about our life. Like, what has been the trajectory of our life? Where are we going in our life? What does God want to change in our life? And so let me ask you a question to start this series. The title of the series is Power to Change. And so the question is, uh, why do you do what you do? Like, when you stop and just think about the decisions that you make, why, why do you do the things that you do? How many of you, because, you know, the reality is we all, there are things that all of us need to change in our life. There are things that God puts his finger on. And we, we are, we're aware that we need to change. And there's something about the calendar going from one year to another that gives us an opportunity to think about the changes we want to make. How many of you made New Year's resolutions this year? How many of you? Anybody put your hand. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. You don't have to tell us what they are. Don't worry. Um, and so, so here, here's the reality about New Year's resolutions. Whatever change you've made, something you want to add to your life, something you want to stop doing in your life, um, you can enjoy that change for about five more days. Uh, because there was an extensive study of 40 million people, and what they discovered is that New Year's resolution, resolutions last until the second Friday of January. So, so literally, enjoy whatever changes. You got about five more days if you're, if you're average. Obviously, I'm talking to a well above average group. But let me ask you again, why do you do the things that you do? So, all right, let, why do you, like, do you have a relationship with your alarm clock? Why, why do you, like, maybe, you know what, we've been doing early morning prayer every day this week, six to seven. We've had people coming out and praying. It's been wonderful. People joining on Facebook Live. Um, I bet a lot of you planned on coming to one of the early morning prayer meetings. You might have planned it so much that you, like, set your alarm. But then your alarm went off, and you hit the snooze button, and you're like, all right, I'll, I'll wear a hat at, at the early morning prayer. And then, and then it went off again, and you're like, I'll join the live stream. And then it went off again, and you said, I will pray later, right? Like, why, you know, some people just, you just kind of hit snooze. Why, why do you do that? Others, there's other people, as soon as the alarm goes off, you like jump out of bed, you tackle the day, you're good to go. What, you know, why, why, do we, why do we do the things that we do? Or let's say you go to a restaurant. A lot of times, New Year's resolutions are about people wanting to get more fit, wanting to get more healthy, wanting to lose weight. And so you go to a restaurant, and you've got, like, a healthy choice, or you have a good tasting choice. Which do you choose, healthy or good tasting? Some, maybe some people, like, they choose healthy, and they're like, I'm going to get the salad with the grilled chicken. Others would say, I'm going to get the chicken, but please make it chicken fried steak with extra gravy. That's what I would like, right? Why, why, do, we, why do we make those choices when it, comes to our, when it comes to our finances? Some of you, maybe when it comes to finances, your paycheck hits, and you just say, okay, you know, first 10% goes to God. Uh, second 10% this is what, you know, what I try to do. Uh, second 10% goes to future me, you know, like make some investments, do some things. And then you have 80% left over and you try to figure out a budget and you try to live on that budget and make some adjustments and be intentional about it. Others are just like the money hits the, the bank account and I just start spending it because like Amazon wants to send me a lot of stuff. Like, they really do. And when I come home and I see the packages on my porch, it gives me joy. And, and, so, and so you just, you know, if there's anything left over, we'll deal with that. But there's never anything left over. Why, why do we make the choices that we make? Why do we do what we do? Now, what I want to talk about today, what I'm going to really zero in on is what I think is the primary reason that we do what we do. But before I get to talking about the primary reason, let me talk about some secondary reasons, just kind of quickly. Uh, secondary reasons we do what we do, and I, by the way, I have a fill-in-the-blank uh, outline on your, on your app. If you want to, this might be a good message. There's some lists, there's some quotes, there's some different things. Uh, and so, so the secondary reasons we do what we do, one is uh, we, we make these choices because we feel obligated to do it, right? You don't want to do it. But you feel like, okay, my spouse wants me to do it, or my boss wants me to do it, or God wants me to do it. I don't really want to do it, so I'm gonna, but I have to do it. Another secondary reason that we make choices uh, is because we want to do it, right? We want to do it. It gives us pleasure. It's enjoyable. So, like, you go out to, like, the Cheesecake Factory, and, and you enjoy a 35 or 4,000, 3,500 or 4,000 calorie meal, and then after that 4,000 calorie meal, you're like, 
well, I got to get cheesecake. I mean, I'm, I'm at the factory for cheesecake, so I got to get some cheesecake. You know, and so we do things because it feels good, because we like to do it. Another reason we do things, this is kind of a big thing. We don't think about it as much. I think a lot of the choices that we make is because we want, we want to be liked. We want people to approve of us. You know, I think, I even think a lot of times when we were, sometimes where we land politically, it's not because of convictions. It's because like, well, I think this is what I got to think about things in order for people to, to like me. Or, or, you know, you make decisions like, what's the crowd doing? What's going to get me accepted? You go on, you know, Instagram and, and you take like 30 different selfies from all sorts of different angles with different filters because your goal is to get as many people as possible to what? To like it. Right? So a lot of what we do is for approval. Now, all of that, those are secondary reasons we do what we do. The primary reason you do what you do is, is because of what you think of you. That is the primary reason. The driving force of our behaviors is our identity. It's what we think about ourselves. Now, the Bible says this in Proverbs 23, 7, the King James. It says, for as a man or as he thinketh in his heart... So he is. So as you think in your heart, then you are that. that. That's what fuels the decisions that you make. Now, there was a Stanford University professor named James March who did this study. And it's one of these examples where like science and, and studies eventually caught up with the Bible. That seems to happen quite a bit. And he came up with something called the, the identity model of decision making. And what he says in the identity model of decision-making is that there are three choices. There are three questions, three things that you think about before you make a decision. And we get to the point, this gets ingrained in us, and so we do it without even thinking about it. And the three questions are, first of all, what type of person am I? So who am I? And again, this is sub, oftentimes it's subconscious. You're not even thinking about it. You're just kind of conditioned. Who am I? What kind of person am I? The second question is, what kind of situation is this? And the third question is, what does a person like me do in a situation like this? And so it all comes back. It starts with that first question, who am I? What is my identity? That's the, that's the primary thing that will drive your decisions. And, and whatever decision is, the, the circumstances will change. But are you, are you the type of person who's trying to follow Jesus and willing to make sacrifices as you follow Jesus as your identity? Or are you the type of person who cuts corners? You know, like if there's a corner to cut, nobody's going to know. I can cut that corner. Are you, are you the type of person who, who just always, always speaks the truth? Or the type of person who says, I, you know what? I, I just have to be seen as strong and in control and in charge all the time. Or, or I'm the type of person who gets frustrated really easily. Or, or I'm just, I'm the type of person. I just, I just look at things like the cup's always half empty and I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. So much of it starts our decisions with our identity. And so, you know, you're taking a test. And maybe there's a couple questions you're not as prepared as you should be. And, and, and you realize that, like, the smartest person in the class is sitting next to you and you can see their paper. What kind of person are you? Are you the type of person who will cut that corner to get a good grade? Or do you say, I'm the type of person who doesn't cheat? Or are you the type of person, if you can take something that's not yours and you're not going to get caught, are you the type of person who steals? Or are you the type of person who, who doesn't do that? Or are you the type of person who's going to make somebody look bad by gossiping about them because it's fun, it's entertaining, we just kind of do that? Or do you say, no, I'm the, I'm the type of person who likes to build other people up. I'm the type of person who forgives or, or I'm the type of person who holds grudges. You know, I don't get mad, I get even. The type of person that you are, that's going to inform the decisions that, that you ask. And then what we do is we ask these three questions. What kind of person am I? What kind of situation is this? And what does a person like me do in a situation like this? So let's say you're driving on Route 4. And somebody, somebody cuts you off. Like you got to slam on the brakes. You almost have an accident. What kind of person are you? Some of you might say, I am the type of person, I am the arm of God's justice. <laughs> and so I am going to get right up on their bumper, I'm going to be six inches off their bumper, and I'm going to ride their bumper for like a mile. Then I'm going to pull up alongside of them, I'm going to make eye contact with them, and I'm going to let them know that there's one way to God, but I'm going to use the other finger. <laughs> right? What? You know what? Or are you the kind of person who would say, you know what? Um, 
boy, thank God I didn't get into an accident, but I don't know what's going on with this person. Maybe they're rushing someone to the hospital. Maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they just weren't paying attention. I'm just going to let it go. Or somebody, somebody, you know, you're a staff meeting, and somebody brings donuts to the office, and you're the kind of person who likes donuts, and they bring Krispy Kremes. And so, you know, let me just tell you, let me help you with this. The best Krispy Kreme donut is the vanilla cream-filled Krispy Kreme donut, okay? That's like empirically verifiable. That is the best donut. So you're the type of person who says, who says I, I'm going to get the good donuts. I'm going to knock people out of the way, and I'm going to get my donuts this morning. Or are you the type of person who says, you know what? I really like donuts, but I don't, I don't know if I need a donut. I'm trying to eat healthier, and I, got, I brought some healthy snacks. So, so I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I don't need that donut today. And so, so the, the type of person that we are, it kind of that identity, it, it informs what we do. And, and a lot of times, our identity, or almost all the time, is like this undertow that can pull us places we don't want to go. So maybe you have a friend, and she is constantly dating loser after loser after loser, getting her heart broken. And so if you were to ask that your friend and say, well, why do you, why do, you do that? She probably would say, I don't like having my heart broken. I don't like the way that this works out, but I'm the type of person who's attracted to the bad boy. Or I'm the, te- I'm the type of person who just draws the wrong kind of person. I don't like it. That's just the kind of person I am. Or maybe you got a friend who is really, really bad with money. And he's always, he's in debt, you know, and, and it's like the credit cards are becoming too much and, and it's really struggling. You say, why, why don't you get on a budget? And he might say, I'm the type of person who's bad with money. I just, I just can't deal with money. I just, I just can't do it. Or maybe you want to get closer to God. You want to get up and come at six o'clock in the morning and pray with people. And you just, you want to get, you know, get up early and you want to spend time with God. But, but it's just really hard because you're not the type of person who has that type of discipline. And so, so what we do, what we think about ourselves, our identity, it ends up informing all of our decisions. Now, years ago, I came to this kind of harsh realization about me that had to do with the type of person I thought I was. Because what I would tell myself, and I kind of spiritualized it, is I am the type of person who if somebody angers me or frustrates me or disappoints me, I would take spiritual gifts tests and I would come out as like, I'm a prophet. And it was like, I am going to tell them in no uncertain terms, that they angered me or they disappointed me or they frustrated me. Like immediately, I'm going to tell them. And I'm going to make sure too, they need to know that they made me angry. And so, so something would happen because, you know, these things happen in life. And so, okay, what kind of person am I? Well, I'm this prophetic. I just kind of tell, tell it like it is and I just don't pull back. And so what does a person like me do in this situation? This person rattles off an email in all caps. This person picks up the phone. This person storms down the, off, you know, storms down the hallway to have that confrontation and like would come in hot. But it was like, I thought, well, that's, that's just how I am. But I realized this wasn't working out so well for me. You know, it was I, showing up like this at times in my marriage was causing, you know, tension between Norm and I. There would be times when I'd realize with my kids that, like, I showed up that way and it had a negative effect on my kids. It was, there were some staff members or situations where there was a lot of tension because of this. And so I had to, I had to make a decision. I had to make a change and say, I don't want to be that type of person anymore. I want to be the type of person who can show up if there's a conflict or if there's an issue. And I want to be the type of person who will show up calmly and try to like define what the situation is, define what the expectations are, try to stay connected and reasonably try to figure this out. And so I'm not saying I've, listen, it, you know, it, it takes a while to like learn some new habits, but I've been, I've been changing the way that I think, changing my identity. And so now my identity is I'm someone who's going to show up and not yell and scream and just try to calmly figure out what the issue is, speak the truth in love, how it is, how it is that we can, that we can stay connected. And so if you want change, if you want to change what you do, you need to change what you think of you. You need to change what you think of you. Have you ever noticed how easy it is for you to believe something bad about yourself that you tell yourself? Which is kind of interesting because if somebody comes and accuses you of something, you probably get really defensive, 
Like, I didn't do that. What are you talking about? But if you accuse yourself of something, you're not defensive. You're like, I'm a loser. I'm terrible. I'm horrible. I'm the worst. Why is that? The reason that we do that, it's so easy for us to believe negative things about ourselves, is because the devil is a liar. It's because the devil is a liar, and the devil has been lying to you from the very beginning, because what the devil wants to do is he wants to get to your identity. He wants to mess up your identity. Jesus tells us this in John chapter 5, uh, John chapter 5, verse, or John chapter 8, verses 44 to 45. He said, you belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Let me tell you something about Satan's plan for your life. He wants to attack your identity. He's been attacking your identity since the day that you were born because he knows that if he can jack up your identity, he can kind of grab you by the nose and lead you wherever he wants you to go. He'll lead you right into his traps. It'll be so much easier. And the reality is we have all been listening to the devil so much that Jesus, what he says at the end of this in verse 45, he says, yet because I tell the truth, you don't believe me. So we've heard the devil's lie so often that when Jesus tries to speak the truth to us about who we really are, it just goes right over our head or it bounces right off. We don't believe him because we've heard so many lies from the devil. What the devil does is he doesn't tell you, listen, this isn't just like power of positive thinking. We all screw up. We all mess up. The devil doesn't come and say, you did something bad. The devil comes and says, you are bad. The devil doesn't just come and say, oh, you had a difficult relationship. The, the, the devil comes and says, there's something wrong with you. People will always reject you. You are a loser. You are a hypocrite. You are broken. You are flawed. That's what the devil does. That's just who you are is what he tells us. And then what happens is our identity gets distorted. And this really messes up our life. Because we start to believe, we just accept these things. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. I have an addictive personality. So I'm going to pop the pill bottle. I'm going to pop the, bo- I'm going to pop the alcohol bottle. I'm going to look at pornography, whatever it is, because I have an addictive personality. Or I stink at money. So no budget, no planning. Just buy stuff on Amazon and sink deeper and deeper into debt. Or we say something I, I see a lot of people struggle with is, you know, I, I, relationships just don't really work out for me. I'm the type of person who gets burned in relationships. And so what we do then is we put walls up and we say, I can't be connected to people. I can't let people in. I can't be a part of a life group. I can't have friends because I'm the type of person who gets rejected. Or I'm the type of person, I just got too much baggage. I'm a mess. I've had so many conversations with so many people through the years as we talk about like, hey, you know what? Go on the journey, you know, know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, make a difference. Be like, no, that won't work for me. I, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. I got too much baggage. It's not going to work. And so what I'll do is I'll just come to church like maybe once a month, maybe twice a month. I'm certainly not going to like discover my purpose. There's no way God could use me to make a difference in the world. And so, and so what happens is we fall into this destructive cycle. And that's why we get stuck because the devil lies and we get our identity jacked up and then it leads to bad decisions, which leads to further like worsening identity issues, which leads to worse decisions. And so what do we do to break free of this cycle? How do we reverse it? And the way that we reverse the devil's destructive cycle is we have to change the way that we think. If you want to see transformation and change in your life, if you want to be someone who goes beyond next Friday, you need to change the way that you think. And you need to realize you are not who the devil says you are. You are not who other people say you are and have maybe said you are for your whole life. You are not even who you tell yourself you are. You are who Christ says you are. That is your identity. That is who you are. You have a Christ-centered identity. And the more we have a Christ-centered identity, the more that's going to lead to Christ-centering habits. And then what that's, what's going to happen is you start to get more Christ-centered habits into your life. You'll have a deeper Christ-centered identity, which will make it easier to do the Christ-honoring habits. And you're going to find that your life changes. But it starts with, who am I? And we see this like fleshed out so clearly in Jesus' life. 
You really see it. Like Jesus, you know, he lived for 33 years, and he didn't just come to earth to go to the cross. He came to earth also to like put God on display, to be tempted in every way that we're tempted, yet without sin, to show us how to do life, right? Jesus was, was fully God, but he was also fully human. And so how did Jesus do all the things that he did? I mean, let's, let's think about Jesus and how he lived his life, right? The Bible says, especially like during the three years of public ministry, he would like teach to like multitudes all the time. So he'd do like the Sermon on the Mount, and there'd be thousands of people there. He'd feed the 5,000. He'd feed the 3,000. The Holy Spirit would be present to heal the sick, and everybody would come out for healing. And, and so he was like, every day he was teaching, day after day after day. And so he was tired. He was exhausted. It was a lot of pressure that was on him. And then he was also teaching his disciples. And so his whole plan was, I'm going to pour into these 12 disciples, and then they're going to change the world. But during his earthly ministry, they just weren't getting it. I mean, they would like say, let's like call down fire on heaven and burn all these people up or arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so there was frustration that he was dealing and trying to, like, these disciples just aren't getting it. There were, you know, the reality of the attacks of the Pharisees and the Sadducees constantly, like these, these trained people, these smart people who knew the law, like let's lay a trap for Jesus and let's, let's falsely accuse Jesus and let's trip him up. And then two times in the Gospels, we read about his family, his brothers coming to him and saying, Jesus, you're crazy. Like, what are you doing? Like, you're, you're making the, you're, you're tearing down the family name. Like, you need to come with us. Like, you've lost your ever-loving mind. And so Jesus is dealing with exhaustion, frustration. Uh, his, he's being slandered. He's being attacked. He's being misunderstood. And then on top of all of that, he knew what was awaiting him at the end. He knew the Father had a cup for him to drink. So how did Jesus deal with all that? I mean, did he just go home at night and, like, watch Netflix or Real Housewives of Jerusalem? <laughs> did, he, did he, like, just go and, like, eat all the brownies or maybe it would have been baklava or something like that and just, like, a comfort food? Did he say, you know what, I'm so exhausted, I, I need to, like, I'm just going to, like, light some candles and I'm going to have a nice warm bath and I'm going to soak in the bath and then I'm going to turn, turn all the water into wine and I'm just going to, like, ha how did, he, how did he deal with all the things that he, was, that he was dealing with? He asked the question. He asked the question in his humanity, who am I? And the answer to that was, I am someone who is absolutely dependent upon intimacy with my father. That, that the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing and the father shows him all that he's doing. And so, and so I am a person who's dependent on, upon intimacy with my father. What is the situation? I'm exhausted, I'm frustrated, I'm misunderstood, I'm hurt. What does a person like me do with, in a situation like this? He goes and he spends time with his heavenly father. Let me show you a picture here. This is a picture of the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives, this is a, obviously a modern picture over the city of Jerusalem. And so with these hills, this hill that, that was right on the outskirts of Jerusalem, and so Jesus' MO, like what he would do because he knew I am the type of person who spends time with his father, he would all the time go up on the Mount of Olives, look down over the city that God had called him to, the center of everything that was happening, where he was going to die, and he would spend time with his heavenly father. The Bible clearly says that, Luke 21, verse 37. Luke 21, 37 says, each day Jesus was teaching at the temple. And each evening, he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. Each day teaching, each night spending time with the Father. Luke 22, verse 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And so he wasn't saying, things are hard I better try really hard to pray. So, oh, let me pray. Oh, I'm distracted. Oh, let me check my phone. No, he, he had habits because it was coming out of his identity. His prayer habit reinforced his identity of who he was as the son of God, which strengthened his habit. See, if we, if we want to see transformation in 2024, we need to not focus on what we do. We need to focus on who we are. And the reason that, that resolutions are only going to last two weeks 
is because people just focus on the behavior that they want to change, not the way that they think about themselves. We start with the who before the do. Instead of focusing on what you want to do, decide who you want to become. And let God reveal to you who you truly are in Christ, your new identity, and let that start forming the decisions that you make. So let me ask you this morning, who do you want to become? Maybe some of you might want to say, I want to be a mom who's fully present with my children. That's who I want to be. I want to be a good mom, fully present. So you put your phone on silence when you're with your kids, so you're not constantly checking things when you're with them, you're fully present. Or maybe you say, I am a young man who has discovered purity in Christ, so I do not look at pornography. Or you say, I am a father who will lay down his life on the regular for his wife and for his kids. Or I am someone who is sober, and my life is a testimony to the transformative power of God. Or you say, I am a person who puts God first in my finances and in everything else in my life. I am a person who puts God first. I am a Christian who reads the word of God on the daily. And I have my own personal Mount of Olives that I go to on a regular basis because I need intimacy with my father. See, it starts with changing the who before we get to the do. There's a book called Atomic Habits by this guy named James Clear, and he said this, every action you take is a vote on the type of person you wish to become. No single instance will transform your beliefs, but as the votes build up, so does the evidence of your new identity. And so to think this through, who am I? What is the situation? What does a person like me do in this situation? And so we need to, we're going to see our life change. We need to change our identity. We need to go to God and ask him who we really are in Christ and what the devil is going to say to you. I'm telling you, you know, after this message, before you get to the car, the devil's going to try to take the seats. And what the devil's going to say is you can't change. But what Jesus says is you are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. Who are you going to believe? And there's a powerful scripture. Let me end with this. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. And it just so sums up everything that we're talking about here and just shows again, like with that whole, you know, identity model of decision making of how the scientific community eventually catches up with the Bible. So verse 22, when you heard about Christ and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, right? With regard to the things that you used to do, you were taught to put off your old self to put off your old identity, the lies that you've told yourself, the things that, that, that the devil's told you, the things that other people have told you, the things that you've told yourself. Put off those things, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new, where? In the attitude of your mind. See, it starts with your mind. It starts with your identity. It starts with how you think. And to then put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so what happens is we change our identity, we change the way we think, and then that starts working itself out in the choices that we make in true righteousness and holiness. So who are you really? What kind of person are you? And so if you are someone who is in Christ Jesus, and I'm not saying you're a perfect Christian, I'm not saying you don't have hang-ups, you don't have baggage, you don't have days that you blow it, but if you have given your life to Jesus Christ and you are, you are forgiven and you are a son or you are a daughter of God and the Holy Spirit is inside of you, this is who you really are. You are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God prepared in advance for you to do. As you go out into this dark world, and there's a lot of darkness in this world right now, and you go into various pockets of darkness, whether it's in your family or in your job place or wherever it is, you are the light of the world. You are a city set on a hill. You are a high-ranking ambassador for the kingdom of God. That is who you are. You are not who the devil says you are. You are not who other people have said you are. Even if you've had your parents just reiterating the lies of the devil from when you were in diapers, you are not who other people say you are. You are not who you tell yourself yourself you are. You are who Jesus Christ says you are. And Jesus Christ says that you are more than a conqueror 
that you are a son or daughter of the living God, that you are forgiven, that you are chosen, that you are redeemed, that you are transformed, that the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is living inside of you. That is who you are. And when we, when we really start to believe the songs that we, we sing and the things that we say and the things that we hear, when we really start to believe it and we say, who am I? I am a child of God. I am someone who belongs to him. Why do you want to see this change in your life? Because a person like me shows up in a situation like this in a different way, makes different choices. And when we start coming from that perspective, it changes everything. And if you, as you start to walk this out, and as you start to want to see God, you know, change your life, we're going to talk in the weeks to come. We're going to talk about habits that we can work into our life. We can talk about how we, more specifically, how we change destructive behaviors. But as you start to work this out, the devil, the liar is going to come and he's going to say, there's no hope. There's no chance. This is who you are. But Jesus, who not only speaks the truth, is the truth, is going to bring his truth to you and that truth will set you free. And so let's just close our eyes for a moment. Just remain seated right now. But I want you to do something. I want you to ask God to reveal to you something in your identity, something that you believe about yourself that doesn't line up with what God says about you. Just ask him to shine the spotlight on that issue, on that area. So, Lord, just come and speak to us right now because, God, I know you want to, God, you, you're conforming us into the image of your son. That you're wanting us in 2024 to become more like Jesus. That you don't want us just ending up in pig slop anymore, God. You want to lead us to the living water. And so, Lord, show us the, the false identities, the false beliefs that keep us going back to that muddy sister. We don't want to believe the lies anymore, God. We want your truth. Just let him speak to you. I think God is, is speaking to us right now. He's just, he knows how, you know, he says, Jesus said, my, my sheep, they, they hear me. They know my voice. So just let him speak to you. Maybe that first thing that you think about is his voice. Or that impression that you have is his voice. Or that Bible verse that comes to mind or that song, that refrain of that worship song is his voice. And if you're here this morning and, and you have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's really where this all starts. I'm, I'm not saying that your life can't change without Jesus. You can make changes. You can maybe even go beyond next Friday. But the kind of identity change that we're talking about, getting into the core of who you are, I think there can be behavior modification, but if we want to see like personal transformation, I think that happens with Jesus living inside of us. Because the Bible says that, that, that he who had no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. That's a new identity. And so if you want to start 2024 with Jesus inside of you, giving you a new identity, allowing so many things in your life to change, just pray this prayer. You don't have to say it out loud. Just say it in your heart. God sees your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I don't like the direction my life's going in. I don't like who I am. And I want to be different. So I believe you are the son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. You're here right now. And so I ask you to forgive all of my sins. I accept your free gift of salvation. Show me who I really am now. And as I follow you, help me to live out of that identity. In Jesus' name, I want to follow you. Keep your eyes closed, but if you prayed that prayer, just raise your hand. If you prayed that prayer this morning, just raise your hand to say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I need to accept. I, I open up the door of my heart to you. 
And I'm going to ask you to do one other thing on your connection card. Check off that you decided to follow Jesus. And if you do that on your connection card, we'll send you some things in the mail this week that will help you figure out what the next steps are you, that God has for you as you as you go on this journey with him. We're going to we're going to pass the offering basket right now. So so those of you, uh, if you look on this last row or here along the wall, look under your seat and uh and there's a new car. No, that's Oprah. Um, there's there's a basket. Uh, there's a there's a, a basket that that's there that um, that we're gonna pass this way and just kind of work it all the way down. You can go ahead and put the connection card and uh, and put any physical offering that you have in the basket as it passes by. But let's just take a moment. Let's not let's let's stay quiet here for a moment because I think there's some ministry that God wants to do. And I just feel that some of you right now, what God is putting his finger on is issues of rejection. That you've just felt your whole life that that you're the type of person who gets rejected. And God wants to, to heal you. God wants to let you know that is not true. You are radically loved. You are accepted by him. And he's the core of reality. That's who you are. Or maybe you're saying, I'm just the type of person who can't follow through on things. I just don't have any discipline. I can't do it. But God wants to say, no, that's not who you are anymore. In your weakness, my strength is made perfect. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Others who just, you know, that just that that feeling of like, I just can't expect good things. I've just experienced too much pain in my life, too much disappointment that I can't hope. But God says you can hope again. A a smoldering wick he won't snuff out. A bruised reed he won't break. And he's the God of hope. And he wants to restore hope in your life. So let's all stand together. And Holy Spirit, I just pray in Jesus' name that you would just move in this room right now. Show us who you are. And God, let let that identity we have in you inform our decisions so that we can become more and more like you, that you give us the power to change. 